All righty. Well, thank you for coming back. Um, so we have uh, the panel this afternoon, or this late morning, I guess, is, gosh, I just forgot, um, money finance and sustainable prosperity. Uh, one thing I noticed was in our panel just before, Bottle said that uh, none of us needed introductions, and so we didn't get one. Um, and I kind of thought that was cool because I'd gotten to the point in my career where I didn't need an introduction. So <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which one flatters them more, to not give them an introduction or to give them introductions. So I don't know. I guess we're running short on time, so we'll, we'll go with the no introduction because they, they don't. First paper is Pavlina Chernova. After 15 years, I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Joblessness and inequality by design, rethinking public policy. Hey. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is that okay? <laughs> It feels loud a little bit. It's still a little loud, right? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. And um, it occurred to me as uh, we've been discussing these various topics that outside of this venue, we normally talk about the problems of the environment, the problems of unemployment, the problems of inequality, and um, as separate issues. Right? Uh, we discuss them as these market failures. We discuss them as complex problems of a globalized world um, that have multiple causes and are um, somewhat formidable and somewhat intractable. But what we're doing here is we're uh, drawing the connections between these, the causes of these problems. We are um, attempting to present a holistic view of money, monetary economies, and the fallout um, that uh, market uh, forces have on the environment and the human impact. So what I will explore today is the connection between equality and unemployment. Um, please take my uh, remarks in the context of what you have already heard about the ecolo uh, ecological limits. Okay, the ecological limits within which we operate. And my basic premise is that unemployment and inequality are really not um, exactly market phenomena. They are problems uh, created through policy design. They are um, policies that have uh, multiple causes, but they operate within certain policy space, within a monetary, op uh, monetary system where the rules are set um, by uh, public institutions, laws, and deliberate public policies. So I will begin with um, sort of our vision, like what do we prioritize here in this room, and then I will draw out the the way conventional policy tends to think about uh, inequality and unemployment and why that thinking has failed. And it has done more than failed. It has reproduced, it has created conditions to reproduce unemployment and to exacerbate inequality. So I usually start you know, with the two outstanding faults uh, of the economic society that we've all read in John Maynard Keynes, but many economists in the political economy traditions have made this verdict, right? We have you know, unemployment and the arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes are two main problems. And this is really an issue about our values, right? We are bringing them to the fore. Why do we have this economy? Who does it serve? And in what way do we want it to work? So we, we single out these two economic problems um, as ones that require special attention. The way I like, and I'm putting a question mark, because obviously um, we can't be talking about these problems if we destroy the environment. <laughs> What's the point of solving unemployment or income inequality if we don't, um, uh, if we uh, 
cannibalize our, our planet. Okay, so um, these are two economic, uh, these are two outstanding faults, not just of economic policy, they are faults of, of economic society, they are faults of economic policy. And my argument will be that our failure to address and solve the first problem uh, our failure to secure full employment actually helps contribute to the exacerbation of the second problem, inequality. So it is, uh, these are two problems by design. All right, so unemployment. Unemployment in a modern market economy, in a capitalist economy, is what we call a monetary phenomenon. Again, we talk about unemployment as an abstraction, but behind Unemployment, there are some very simple, basic things. When we talk about unemployment, we really are talking about people being able to participate in the economy, earn income, and contribute um, in one way or another to uh, the economic process. But from the point of view of firms, unemployment is a monetary phenomenon. From the point of view of firms, that quite simply means that it is not worth uh, the firm to hire an extra person. It, it is not profitable to employ more people than they already are employing. So, um, you know, in economics we've got various models of the supply of labor and demand for labor, and then we use all sorts of um, price uh, misallocation explanations of why we have unemployment. Um, and all of these are wrong. The problem of unemployment is really is that there are not enough, there's not enough hiring the in the aggregate, Employment is determined by how many firms are willing to hire depending on their profit expectations. So from the point of view of firms, that's what a monetary phenomenon means. It's just not profitable to hire the extra additional person. From the point of view of households, unemployment is a monetary phenomenon because somebody wants a wage earning opportunity and the opportunity is not there. So again, we talk about the inadequacy of skills, the um, you know, globalization, forces of globalization, and that uh, in some ways, unemployment is this market phenomenon that can't quite fully be uh, resolved. But we also forget that um, unemployment is an explicit public sector policy. In uh, the way that our friend Warren likes to put it, is that unemployment is evidence that the currency has been restricted, right? The provision of currency has been restricted. And as a issuer, monopoly issuer of the currency, you have the responsibility to make currency available for those who seek it. Now here we've got to qualify this because um, how we provide the currency and how we actually um, fix the aggregate demand problem, the method by which we spend is crucially important. And this is the, the focus of my, uh, of my remarks. Unemployment is not a private sector failure. It's a public sector failure. Firms are simply not in the business of guaranteeing true full employment. That's the nature of a market economy. And government can try to massage all of these factors like profit expectations and um, the savings rate, etc. Uh, the interest rate to create conditions so that the private sector creates full employment, but that is not their job, right? The private sector may secure full employment, but only as a fluke, as, a, as an accident. And this was the lesson that we got from John Maynard Keynes. And if, if the government sector is unable to create conditions that will um, induce the private sector to permanently create full employment, it is the job of the public sector to do so, to create those conditions. So, I see employment as an end um, in itself. So we call unemployment a special problem. I wanna talk a little bit about why it is special, why it is unlike anything else. It is persistent, it is perverse, it is pernicious. Of course, it's not a new problem. You know, most people are talking about unemployment now because we've just lived through the greatest financial crisis of our lifetime for most of us. Um, but they ha there have been problems within in the labor market that have been there for quite some time, for decades. You know, we know that uh, if you end up being unemployed, the chances of being in unemployment for longer periods of time have increased as the proportion of those who are unemployed 
um, who are in long-term unemployment has increased over time. So that's basically the second one trend that this chart is um, demonstrating. Now, of course, it has gotten much worse. Um, there has been a mass exodus from the uh, labor force uh, in the last uh, few years since uh, 2008, and a unprecedented decline uh, in the employment to population ratio. So when I say it's persistent, uh, I mean that uh, quite literally, we don't have um, adequate number of jobs for everyone who wants a job. We have, um, so this chart shows you, you know, job openings, the red line are job openings, and the blue line are the unemployed, the jobs that are needed. And there is an ongoing, on ongoing basis, a gap between the number of jobs that are needed for all those who want them. So you can train and educate and improve the skill of the uh, labor force, but in the end, we will still be experiencing an a shortage in the aggregate if we have not provided uh, abundant uh, job opportunities. So it's a persistent problem. Um, it is perverse. I, I like to call this the mark of unemployment. You know, to be unemployed um, carries with it a certain stigma and blocks future opportunities. Um, there is um, you know, so in, in a way you can say that unemployment breeds unemployability, at least in the, in the eyes of the, of the private sector. There is um, there's some, um, well, anecdotal evidence, you've seen it all on monster.com, where, you know, you say the unemployed need not apply, uh, which is precisely the problem we are trying to solve, right? The unemployed need to apply. Um, but the reason why you see this is because in the eyes of the employer, Nine months of unemployment equates to four years off of work experience. So, you know, you imagine yourself an employer, you're looking at a bunch of resumes, and who do you hire first? You will hire the one with the job. Then you will hire maybe somebody who has been out of the labor force for a few months, and then it will be the other person who's been out of the labor force for a few months, and you're going to scratch your head, and you're going to wonder, why have they been out of the labor force? What happened in between? What did they do? That would be the first thing you would wonder. And so you have this kind of perverse effect that the employed and employable actually win the game of, uh, in the job search. Right? And um, we see this... Um, by another research that indicates that almost 50% of firms who are hiring, of new firm hiring, is actually poaching. Right? You are raiding other firms for their employees. So we've got um, what is a seemingly uh, intractable problem that is also pernicious. And, well, I mean, the first thing that we need to recognize is that we are already paying for unemployment. And, uh, you know, there are direct costs. But in this uh, conference, we have been emphasizing that the direct costs are not really um, the ones we need to focus on. Yes, we are paying in the form of unemployment insurance, that you can add up all the SNAP programs, the temporary assistance to needy families, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of do dollar value. But what we really need to be looking at is the human cost, the indirect cost, um, that are express themselves in, in, in less social mobility, economic freedom, more instability in the economy, more financial crisis, depressed growth, um, eroding communities, health, enormous health uh, costs, um, uh, increase in suicides, um, underfunding of other programs um, like state pension funds and uh, social security. Um, as well as social and political instability. So, I mean, there is just, it's, the, the research is enormous. I mean, it's just economists don't do that research. You know, what, are, what is the fallout of unemployment? Virtually every major socioeconomic problem is related to unemployment from child outcomes to family cohesion. We already listed a number of these um, earlier on. So, you know, this is a chart by a friend of ours, Bill Mitchell, who actually looked at the dollar value, the daily losses due to unemployment, and, you know, and he basically made the argument that because we have a policy of maintaining unemployment, not dealing with it, uh, every day we forego about $10 billion uh, of GDP. That's it. Every day it's, it's foregone 
growth and output. Um, and I like to think of this not in terms of the 10 billion number, but in terms of what stands behind the 10 billion number. That's $10 billion worth of um, fewer childcare uh, outfits, fewer programs, fewer uh, services for the retired, fewer environmental projects. Like that's what that 10, million, 10, 10 billion dollar means. Um, and so why do I say that we have unemployment and inequality by design? Well, it's because that's what policy attempts to do. It is, it is, the first thing is that we have a commitment to a Nairu. And Nairu is this concept of natural unemployment, which basically says that no matter what you do, the economy will create only so many jobs. However much you stimulate the, the private sector, you're gonna create only so many jobs, a number of people will be left unemployed. And if you attempt to move the economy beyond this barrier, you're just gonna create a lot of inflation. So this is the most that you can do. So we already have very explicit commitment to maintaining unemployment. I think Matt was saying it, uh, or Scott was saying it earlier, that if we um, are serious about inflation control, then we need to use, this is an, an, a necessary evil. Right? So that is, that is our explicit commitment not to solve the joblessness problem. The second thing is that the way we think about solving the unemployment problem is that we think about it as a byproduct of all sorts of other things that we would do. So the way we design policy is to, um, to work directly on other channels that will then hopefully trickle down to the jobless, that will hopefully produce the desired employment effect. So what do I mean by that? You know the conventional trickle down policy, right? We say, you know, tax policy is our primary direct tool of managing the economy. And the way uh, we do this is by reducing top marginal tax rates. Hopefully that creates incentives by the um, job creators, right? And uh, that creates a little more investment. That creates more growth. And growth then brings employment opportunities. So... Look at this, you know, the, how many steps you need to go through to get to the employment outcome. And if we don't get there, then maybe something is broken within the economy that we can't quite fix. Bank subsidies is another, is another method of stabilizing our economies, and dealing with, uh, with downturns. So the idea here is that um, we need to fix the financial system. You know, it is essential to the health of, of the economy, and we need to... Um, improve uh, bank balance sheets. So the uh, purchases like a TARP 1 or TARP 2 program would be uh, large-scale purchases of toxic financial assets that improves the bank balance sheets. That um, uh, instills confidence in the creditor. And they then look for um, uh, lending opportunities. They finance investment. And then that investment will later on bring the desired employment outcome. So here, the transmission mechanism has gotten even longer. Right? Um, and it works through this wealth, uh, wealth effect. Another way in which we um, manage the economy is through uh, firm subsidies or direct contracts. Right? This is what we call conventional aggregate demand management. Again, we're looking to solve the problem through the private sector. So we are saying, okay, here, here are some incentives. Hire a few more people. You know, here are some contracts with guaranteed uh, profits. Um, accelerated depreciation, various cost reduction measures, and the idea is that that will instill confidence in the firm and the entrepreneur, and then they will create um, more investment, growth, and employment will be a byproduct of it. Again, um, we, where the, because the philosophy, the neoliberal philosophy, is that we have to work through the private sector, we are only looking for, for solutions that, um, that stimulate private investment and growth. So this investment-led, growth-led model has failed. It hasn't worked. It has never produced full employment ever. And yet it is the conventional uh, approach to uh, dealing with, with the economy. And so because we know it doesn't, it doesn't create full employment, jobless recoveries have become uh, the norm. Right? We have now resigned ourselves, but that's the most that we can do. What I will talk in a moment um, is that it's not just that we have more job seekers than there are vacancies. 
but the way we actually stimulate the economy through these various channels erodes income inequality between labor and capital and within labor. Get to that. Um, so uh, what happens uh, within labor? Well, I, I gave you an indication already. In the, uh, in the job search process, right? it's the game of musical chairs. So what happens is the high skill, high tech, high education people win out. They experience virtually no unemployment. Very little short spells of unemployment. Um, small dips right, in employment trends, shorter spells, and later they are what we call first fired, last, first hired, last fired. Right? Low skill, um, low education, etc., are those who experience the most prolonged spells of unemployment, the biggest, the, the largest uh, amount of layoffs, the earliest uh, declines in employment. So they are the last uh, hired, first fired. And so what we've got is a virtuous employment cycle and a vicious employment cycle. And unemployment, surprise, surprise, is always concentrated at the bottom, where people have the greatest difficulty sort of latching onto the economic ladder and staying there. So what we need to do as policy is not to somehow work through these incentives through the private sector, but quite directly address and break the vicious cycle that creates and perpetuates unemployment. So here you've got you know, uh, a situation where um, because you have more stable employment opportunities, longer job tenure, the opportunities for income growth are better if you are in the labor market, if you're high skilled and high, um, high wage. But for those at the bottom, the opportunities of wage growth are smaller. So you've got this, this other sort of inequality where uh, within, within labor itself you um, have a, um, um, uh, an, an erosion in income distribution. So this is a, a chart you, many of you have probably seen, um, and it shows how long it takes to recover the lost payrolls in a recession. And what the chart shows you is that in the, since the, um, since 81, see the purple line here is 81, um, the black line is 90, ni uh, 90 uh, the brown is 2001, and the red here is 2007, it's taken longer and longer and longer to recover the lost payrolls. So this agile American economy, right, is really not creating jobs. Um, and my point is that our failure to solve the unemployment problem early will prevent us from solving it later because we are embedding within our labor markets these vicious cycles of long-term unemployment, of unemployability. So, so what seemed to be a, a difficult problem in the 70s is now more intractable today. Um, so let's talk a little bit about inequality. Well, here's a uh, rich-poor jobs gap. You, uh, unemployment um, for those who are earning less than $20,000 a year is 21%. Those 150,000 above is 3.2%. Again, you know, virtually no unemployment for the well-to-do. Underemployment mirrors this image. So we've got um, uh, another way of looking at these vicious cycles that are brewing um, at the bottom of the income distribution. Underemployment is 40% um, and seven, only 7.2% 7 for, for the well-to-do. So this is, this is the chart that many of you have seen that um, I put together a couple of years ago. And uh, it, you know, it garnered a lot of attention. Um, what this chart shows you is how income growth is distributed between the top 10% and the bottom 90% during expansions. The, the, the question is, when, the in, when income grows, who gains? Right? Does a rising tide lift all boats? Right? So that's, that's what I'm looking at. You can look at it by business cycle. I've looked at it in many different ways. But this one is important because the argument is, as long as you produce growth, everything will be fine. But what this chart demonstrates is that over time, growth delivers gains to select few. All of the growth in the last two expansions has gone to the top 
And in the last expansion, in fact, more than 100% incomes for the bottom 90% have been falling while the economy was growing. So they are really not experiencing the recovery. And most people are looking at this chart and they're saying, look at, you know, what a horrible thing happened in the 70s and in the 80s, you know, a completely lopsided economy. And so they, they concentrate on sort of the latter part of the, uh, of, of the chart. The one that, that I, I, like, worried me is the first part of the chart. Like, why is it that during the golden age of American economy, when we experienced expansions, fewer and fewer of the shares were going to the bottom 90%. Okay, not a dramatic trend. Clearly, the majority of the income growth went to the bottom 90%, but that share was shrinking. And so that, to me, um, tells me that the way we are, uh, we are growing, the way we have um, uh, used policy, right, has, has delivered uh, fewer and fewer gains um, to the bottom 90%. Now, it, this is not an ideal chart because the top 10% are is a very kind of mixed group. And so I've looked at it by 99 versus 1% and 99.99 versus 0.01%. And that one is even more shocking because you have a tiny, tiny sliver of households in the US, 0.01%, that are taking over a third of the income growth. Right? It, is, it, it is the rise of the 0.01%. Um, so, so basically, what this is telling us is that growth brings more inequality. But it doesn't have to be that way because growth is a policy choice. Let me look, show you the, the graph for Sweden. So um, it is in the later period, the last few decades, it's the same thing. It, even in, in Sweden, you see the shares, the, the majority of growth going to the top 10%. But in the 60s and the 70s, it was the opposite. A greater share of that growth went to the bottom 90%. And that increased uh, with a, a, a few of the expansions during their golden era. Well, we know that you know, Sweden is, um, you know, has had one of the few long-standing um, uh, policy uh, commitments to full employment. It's called the corporatist model where labor, unions, uh, uh, companies, and government uh, have coordinated in an explicit way to, uh, to produce full employment and guarantee employment um, over, the, um, over the long run. Now, with uh, the dawn of new liberalism, uh, the Swedish model was slowly dismantled um, and abandoned, and surprise, surprise, we see very quickly uh, income inequality erode there as well. So, this should not be a surprise. If your policy commitment is to stabilize the incomes of the wealthy or bankers, their incomes are going to go first. Right? If you're deriving your income from financial markets and your policy is to stabilize uh, asset prices, buy up uh, toxic financial assets, boost the uh, uh, stock market, yes, their incomes are going to grow first. If your policy is to cut top marginal tax rates, then by design, you are encouraging income growth at that uh, place of the income distribution. But most of us earn our income from work. Most of us count on our wages and our salaries for our income growth. And so what we need is employment. But if your policy fails to secure employment and that becomes a more and more difficult problem over time, then surely people who count on income from the labor market will lose out. So let's, um, let's uh, talk about what we might be able to do. Let's rethink policy design. Well, there are a few things that we know. The public sector is the only sector that can be countersink. The, the, the private sector doesn't wake up one morning and say, you know, we've had enough of this crisis, let's just go spend and hire some people. It's only, it's all, so the private sector is pro-cyclical. So the only, the only uh, sector that can do this is the public sector. Point number two, the unemployed are already in the public sector. The public sector is paying for unemployment. 
we, uh, beyond from paying for food assistance and unemployment insurance, we are paying for the fallout from unemployment. High incarceration rates, higher crime, uh, higher health problems, um, all of those problems that we already listed, uh, we pay them. You know, the, we pay those costs in direct and indirect way. Um, we know that the federal government has the greatest policy space because the federal government that has monetary control, sovereign monetary control, um, can choose how to spend. And thus, it is responsible for the problem of unemployment. Failure to directly um, secure full employment over long, the long run is basically choosing to have an unemployment policy, right? To pay for a, you know, the existence of a uh, pool of unemployment. So, as I explained, the way government spends reinforces income inequality. So, the job guarantee is a jobs first solution. Fidel is going to explain the details of this program, um, but I, um, I want to emphasize one uh, point of this program. It's through the buffer stock mechanism. We have an unemployment buffer stock today, right? We have an unemployment safety net. That's what we do. We, the private sector decides how many workers they need. In downturns, we have mass unemployment, mass layoffs. Unemployment is, is like a disease, right? It feeds on itself. It's like a virus. And it, you know, more unemployment creates, breeds more unemployment. And so uh, we see the sharp turns in, uh, in unemployment. What does the government do? On standby, they just increase unemployment support, uh, food assistance, various social programs, which, by the way, expire. Um, and so that's the stimulus that we provide to the economy uh, so that the floor doesn't fall from uh, beneath us. Right? This is our aggregate demand management uh, approach. And then when the economy slowly recovers, then the government participation withdraws by um, uh, limiting its uh, spending, social spending. Now, how about an employment safety net? Instead of having an unemployed buffer stock, how about having an employed buffer stock? have a program on standby that will guarantee employment opportunities. Various people will come and go, some will stay, um, some will have a very short stint in the program, but you have a standby policy of an opportunity. Have you been laid off? Do you need three months to regroup and figure it out? Okay, you've got unemployment insurance. Do you not want to be on unemployment insurance? You need a living wage? We've got one for you. And so this is a voluntary option that can be chosen by those that really want uh, a job. So when we talk uh, about unemployment, we are talking about forced idleness. So the current unemployment stabilizer, as I've, I've described, is we have an unemployment pool that offers income assistance, and so we've got income from forced idleness. This is our stimulus. Well, make it an employment stabilizer. Have an employed pool, where you get income from that base wage that can be a living wage, and you got a uh, wage income from work. So it is a bottom-up approach. I like to call it a bottom-up approach because you go directly to the problem. You solve the problem of joblessness directly. You don't wait for it to trickle down from the bank system, to, from the wealthy, um, from the highly skilled, so that their demand creates demand for low-skilled workers. You don't do it that way. You go and directly solve the problem from the bottom. So the program is voluntary. It matches the unemployed to projects that serve the public purpose. This is what we've already articulated quite clearly. We have, what did Galbraith call it? You know, um, private opulence and public squalor. Right? There are so many public needs um, that we, we um, need fulfilled, and there are so many people to do them. So this, this is a policy that fits the job to the people. It's a very important aspect of, of the program. The private sector fits uh, people to the jobs, right? I have a firm, I've got a bunch of tasks that need to be done, and I'm looking for the best person that can do them, right? I have a job, I'm fitting people to the job. This is a policy that fits jobs to the people. We understand that you want work. We understand that it's important for you to have wage earning opportunity, and we will find you an employment opportunity. If you have low skill, we won't make you do some complicated engineering stuff, right? We will find you an opportunity that fits your skill and ability. This is an approach that puts planet and people before profits, right? The private sector is a, the profit-driven sector. The public sector is the 
public service sector, public purpose. We pay a base living wage, we offer training and education, federally funded, not federally administered. We've already heard multiple visions of how this can be implemented uh, from the bottom up through these community initiatives, social enterprises, localities, etc. So let's rethink the safety net. Um, in 2009, I did uh, some very quick, quick calculations what the Recovery Act could deliver. Right? If you remember, the debate at the time was anything but public works. Right? Tax cut here, unemployment, but not public works. If we had done public works, we could have created 20 million living wage jobs for the, for the budget that was allocated, including costs for materials. But, and of course, you, do, you don't have to create that many. You wouldn't have had to create that many. You only needed to put 5 million people to work. Six, the private sector will pick up the difference because you have stabilized demand in a way that unemployment insurance cannot stabilize. And it's not just you stabilize demand from the firms, but your, the behavior of, the peop of people changes. It's one thing to spend, right, to, to do your family budgeting when you have a living wage job. It's a, another thing to be on unemployment insurance and wonder when that will expire. Um, so, so, you know, this example I, I give very often because I think it's, it's quite compelling. You know, we have a welfare state. You know, we have to live with this idea that we reinvented what government must do in the 30s, right? And though our welfare system doesn't work so well, we have found solutions uh, that are direct solutions to problems. So the direct approach has always been if the problem is retirement income insecurity, we will give you retirement income. And that's social security. If the problem is homelessness, we will give you a home. If the problem is food insecurity, we will provide food. But if the problem is joblessness, that's what we should provide, a job, not unemployment insurance. So the, the merits of this approach, I think, are very many. But they also um, indicate a rethinking of what the safety net is and uh, that we need to sort of fulfill this final piece of the safety net, provide jobs in a very direct manner. So all we're doing with our uh, policy of unemployment is we waste resources, human resources, environmental resources. It's a, it's a policy of waste. And I love these quotes um, by Keynes, who articulated a similar vision. And he said, you know, the real difficulty is first to produce the intellectual conviction that full employment and more equitable income distribution are attainable. And then to intellectually devise the means to secure them. And so he went to say, insufficiency of cleverness, not goodness, is the main trouble. Right? We're all good people but we need to be convinced that this is attainable and devise the means. And I think that the modern money approach also adds, and we also must understand our monetary system. So if you can't find a way to solve the problem of unemployment, just leave it to us. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker also needs no introduction and won't get one. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Is this on? Sorry. All right. Thank you very much. Well, um, first I want to uh, mention that all the PowerPoint presentations will be posted on our website uh, soon, within the next uh, day or so, with the permission of all the speakers, of course. Um, that being said, um, I'm going to uh, tell you what I wanted to present today first, and then I'm going to skip over quite a bit of the first half because it provides a lot of bit of, uh, uh, quite a bit of the history, the intellectual history of the idea of the job guarantee. So uh, in this presentation and throughout the conversation, sometimes we use the terms interchangeably. We use the term job guarantee, um, sometimes we use the term employer of last resort, sometimes public service employment, 
um, all of this in the literature, the post-Keynesian MMT literature is pretty much the same. So I'll, I'll use both terms, employer of last resort or ELR um, and job guarantee uh, occasionally. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the intellectual history, that this is not something we invented last year or five years ago or 20 years ago. There's a long history of intellectual uh, development um, specifically on the idea of the employer of last resort, and sometimes from the left and sometimes from the right of the political spectrum, uh, which is surprising to many. And that left-right divide, political divide, doesn't really apply when it comes to understanding money, to understanding functional finance, to understanding MMT. And that's why you see a lot of people on the MM MMT, in the MMT crowd who are you know, politically very libertarian, very different than what you would normally expect of, uh, of people who would support job guarantee. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll jump straight into the, the presentation. Starting with William Petty, who said the unemployed ought neither to be starved nor hanged nor given away. The unemployed are an untapped source of enrichment for the nation and that they could be publicly employed to build infrastructure. Um, so he very quickly recognized that unemployment is a problem for society. And we have issues of, you know, public infrastructure needs that we can, it, it seems very obvious, you know, you hire the unemployed to build a nation. David Ricardo, who many people think of him as, um, you know, the father of free trade or whatever, uh, may be true in his early years because he didn't really see the full scale industrial revolution until the very last few years of his life. And when he wrote the third edition of his Principles of Political Economy, he had to add one chapter to reflect on that, a chapter on machinery, very interesting, um, you know, not really the Ricardo that most people know, it's more like a Marx. Um, the substitution of machinery for human labor is often very injurious, injurious to the interests of the class of laborers. The same cause which may increase the net revenue of a country may at the same time render the population, the population redundant, unemployed, and deteriorate the condition of the laborer. Uh, so he very quickly uh, recognized that towards the end of his life. Uh, and adding a chapter to a third edition is not something that Ricardo takes lightly, I think. Um, then we have the Great Depression and Keynes, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip over a lot of this stuff because a lot of it is common knowledge by now. But the, the New Deal policies were not an accident. They were designed by policy. And this is a, a theme that many of us are, are saying today, that the policy choice is something that we make. We don't say, we have a Great Depression, let's wait for an accident to you know, create full employment. It was designed by Congress. It was implemented at the local level, and an alphabet soup of organizations were put in place, uh, Public Works Administration, the CCC, and so on. It's, it was done. We know how to do it. Uh, and, um, and even at the time when we said we can't afford it, let's cut spending, the Great Depression was back again very quickly until World War II. So in that context, uh, Keynes was developing uh, his general theory and his rebellion against um, neoclassical economics, his rebellion against his own work, earlier work. Um, what Keynes brought to us is an intellectual framework to really um, help us design that intellectual capacity for the full employment program that many of us um, uh, write about these days. Um, I'm gonna skip over this because it's gonna take a while. And then Minsky comes in the 60s uh, in the context of the war on poverty and he starts writing about the employer of last resort. He said, you take workers as they are, where they are, and you provide jobs. You don't say, well, we'll go get some training and then compete in the private sector and maybe um, you'll find employment. Uh, he was very critical of the war on poverty because he believed it was more of a war on the poor rather than on poverty because it didn't address the root causes um, of, of the problem. And he, you know, builds on Keynes very clearly that, you know, he believes that the problems of the capitalist system are endogenous, are internal to the system. He said the dynamic of a capitalist system which has complex, sophisticated, evolving financial structures leads to the development of conditions that are conducive to incoherence, to runaway inflations, and deep depressions. 
business cycles for uh, Minsky, uh, Hyman Minsky, are driven by these waves of optimism and pessimism that drive the business cycle. Meaning when consumers and businesses have optimistic expectations about the future, if they believe that there are profits to be had, if they believe that their employment situation in terms of workers, their employment situation will continue, then they'll spend and companies will hire and optimism will breed uh, situations of employment. But also when you have pessimistic expectations about the future, then consumers will reduce spending, businesses will lay off workers and you go into that downward spiral. That's the nature of the system. And without having a buffer built into the system to compensate for the lack of employment opportunities during crisis, uh, then capitalism is uh, essentially doomed. So Minsky's uh, proposals, uh, which Randy described briefly yesterday in his keynote speech, um, looking at the last bullet point, is a big government and big bank. Big bank meaning a Federal Reserve Bank that you know, regulates the financial system, but also intervenes as a lender of last resort. Um, and a big government, meaning an employer of last resort, that steps in and creates a buffer stock of employment as opposed to a buffer stock of unemployment. Uh, the idea of the buffer stock that, uh, Minsk, uh, that Minsky and, uh, and Pavlina just um, uh, mentioned, we do have lots of buffer stock mechanisms that the government actually uses on a regular basis. We have a buffer stock for corn, a buffer stock for wheat, a buffer stock for oil. Um, all of these commodities are considered by the government to be extremely important for the functioning of the economy. And as a result, we designed a mechanism to stabilize the price of corn, the price of wheat, the price of oil. So the government acts as a buyer of last resort when there's too much corn in the system and stores it in massive, gigantic warehouses, some of them in Kansas City. Um, and when there is a shortage of corn in the market, the government will release that excess supply so that the price of corn stays stable over time. So corn is not allowed to remain unemployed in the United States and many other countries. Same thing for oil, same thing for other commodities. We don't allow those commodities to remain unemployed. We have a program for them and yet we have no buffer stock system for people. When they lose employment, they're left to their own devices. Um, corn doesn't complain. Corn doesn't commit suicide. Corn doesn't get depression. Corn doesn't have all the social problems that we have in society. I'm not saying all problems are related to unemployment, but a lot of those problems are related to unemployment, uh, and there are tons of studies that uh, Pavlina and others have, have cited. Um, there were many other lesser known uh, scholars who contributed to this intellectual history. Um, I'm not gonna go through the details of their work, but I'll, I'll urge you to look at uh, their work, it's fantastic. Uh, the first two are lesser known, even in the job guarantee and MMT circles, uh, John Pearson and John Philip Warnett. John Pearson from the left of the political spectrum John Philip Warnett from the right of the political spectrum, writing about job guarantee, functional finance, MMT, um, back in the 50s and 60s. Um, but Abba Lerner is much more known in, in our circles uh, as one of the founding figures of uh, functional finance. Uh, John Pearson was uh, not an academic economist, he was a government economist. He was essentially obsessed with the idea of full employment and couldn't, you know, uh, stop writing about it, advocating for it for many, many years. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll just, uh, he calls his program economic performance insurance. It's essentially a job guarantee program, a buffer stock program, where the government acts as the employer of last, of, of the employer of last resort. He said the government should stand ready to step in as employer of last resort or step out when necessary as disemployer of first resort. The mechanism is to permit uh, the mechanism to permit that would be a nationwide reserve shelf of additional public services and public works. So at the local community, uh, the same way that uh, uh, Rob Parento was explaining this morning, uh, the local community, they, need, they know the problems that they have in the local community. They know the needs of the community. So all you have to do is get people together and build a list of projects, a list of problems that the local community needs to address. And then you'll have funding from the federal government through a grant-making uh, program that will allow local communities to get things done. Uh, 
uh, with decent wages, living wages. Um, and if, if need be, he said, the government could reshelf some of public works projects or scale back um, as, as necessary. Uh, John Philip Warnett, as I mentioned, uh, comes from the right of the political spectrum, but also the context he was writing during the Cold War. So he made the case that you know, full employment is the best way to beat communism um, um, in the United States. And you know, he, he, did, he was very concerned about the political aspect of things. But in terms of the financing, in terms of how central banks work, in terms of sovereign currency, he had the whole thing figured out uh, in, uh, in his writings uh, in the 50s and, and 60s. He talks about very meticulous coordination between fiscal and monetary policy. You can't you know, pretend that central banks are independent because uh, they're not. Um, and on, on money, I, I love this quote from uh, Warnett. It, it sounds like Randy Ray. It sounds like... Uh, uh, Apple Lerner, it sounds like any of the MMTers. Func the function of the federal taxes is preventing inflation. The federal government literally does not have to collect taxes in order to get the money for its expenditure. Like any other sovereign government, our federal government has the power of creating money. This is 1945. Um, Abba Lerner, writing in the 30s and, uh, and 40s and, and later on, um, develops the idea of functional finance that um, many of us have, have talked about. When I say functional finance, the term that a lot of people use today is modern money theory or MMT, um, uh, pretty much the, the same. So the principles of functional finance that I want to hi highlight here, and we've heard some of this. A sovereign government is a monopoly issuer of, it, of the currency. In the U.S., it's you know only the U.S. government can print dollars. It's illegal for anybody else to do it, to go to jail for that. Government has no limit on printing money. A sovereign government creates a demand for its currency by imposing a tax on the population. Um, so that's the demand for the currency. Government spending puts money into the system and taxes when they're collected by the federal government essentially withdraw currency from the system or destroy money from the system. We have it backwards. Most people believe that taxes pay for government services. People say it all the time. If we don't pay taxes, you're not, you know, who's going to pay for the police officers and the teachers and the firefighters? Well, from a functional finance perspective, you can't logically say that because the government have, has to spend the money into existence first, put it into the system, then the rest of us use it to, you know, uh, buy goods and services and pay taxes. How can you pay taxes to the government without having the currency, which comes from the government in the first place? Uh, so we, we have it uh, backwards there. And then people say, well, the government borrows from us because the government is broke. How can you be broke? How can you borrow from the population when you print your own sovereign currency? Why would I borrow from you if I can print my own money? Right? So what's the purpose of bonds? Why does the government issue bonds? Well, it's not to finance spending, but it's really to withdraw currency from the system, to stabilize interest rates, um, but it's not to finance government spending. Um, go to the, the deficit issue. So people complain about the deficit and the national debt. The size of the deficit from a functional finance person uh, perspective does not matter. What matters is the function of the deficit. That's why it's called functional finance. If the function of the deficit is to achieve full employment, price stability, environmental sustainability, so be it. It doesn't matter what the level is. It matters what the goals are that you achieve. A deficit and a national debt can always be managed by a sovereign issue of the currency. Now, this is very important because when we talk about the federal government deficit and national debt, this is very different from your personal debt to your bank because that personal debt, you have to work hard, earn money, and pay it off. Otherwise, you're in trouble because you can't print your own money. And the bank, even if you do, you, the bank will not take it. But the federal government is a completely different uh, situation. So that's why we talk about sovereign currency issuers. Uh, at the state level, it's different. The state of Ohio doesn't print you know, its own currency, so we, we have other um, issues there. Um, and the conclusion of this perspective is that he can't argue, like most um, mainstream economists, that there's a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. There's a narrow. Uh, from our perspective, you can achieve both full employment and price stability uh, and sustainability without, uh, without uh, any problem. So Minsky's work in the 60s and then 
a whole bunch of uh, institutes and centers. Um, many of them are represented here, have done a lot of work over the last couple of decades um, on the job guarantee program. And uh, here at the Benzaga Institute, we're, we're hoping to continue that tradition. So how does the buffer stock mechanism work? Um, Minsky says, take workers as they are, where they are, give them jobs first, training later, on the job training. So the government essentially acts as an employer of last resort, will offer to hire anybody who's ready, willing, and able to work at a socially established living wage, minimum wage, whatever you want to call it. We as a society can decide what that level is. And essentially hires everybody who's available to work. Local communities at the state level, city level, village level will decide what the priorities are and we'll work with local nonprofits who are already doing a lot of this work. And you ask a lot of the nonprofits here in town and they tell you, we rely on donations, we rely on volunteers, and we, can, we, we do what we can to, you know, to deal with the problems that we deal with. We don't have financial resources, but we, but we have ideas and we have people who are willing to work and to accomplish those projects. So here the funding will come from the federal government the selection, the implementation, the design, the monitoring, everything will be done at the local level with partnerships with uh, NGOs and community organizations and, uh, and, um, and city officials. Um, so it's a decentralized program. Only the funding comes from the sovereign issue of the currency. The implementation, again, is at the local level. Um, what happens to the private sector when the government takes all the unemployed? in uh, public service employment. Well, the private sector can always hire somebody from the pool of job guarantee workers. If anything, they would actually prefer that. And Pavlina just talked about the research that a lot of employers would rather hire somebody who's already employed. They don't want to hire the unemployable, right? That's code word for people who have been unemployed uh, for a long time, people with criminal records, people with disability, women and minorities, they're unemployable, right? Because they've been unemployed for a long time, so we're not gonna even consider them. But here, now you have people who are working in the job guarantee program, show up on time, useful, productive work is being done. They have a track record of being employable. They have a track record of being productive. Would you rather hire them or hire somebody who's been unemployed for two years? Well, as a business person, I'd rather hire somebody who's been working in a community service project, then hire somebody who's been unemployed for, for two years. I'm not a business person, but I talk to a lot of business people and they say they would. Um, so it reduces the depreciation of skills caused by unemployment uh, and it will have training and educational components to improve skills. Um, and most importantly, it will, it will reduce the uncertainty that we face over the business cycle, um, both on the business side and also on the consumer uh, side. If you're a business, um, you're always watching for you know, uh, consumer confidence uh, indices and things like that. So this will smooth the business cycle uh, in, that, in that sense. Um, the employer of last resort will not displace private sector work because you will specifically design projects that address issues that are not even provided by the private sector. So you're complementing the private sector you're not replacing the private sector. So the local community projects will not start building cars and competing with you know, Detroit. They're building community development projects, environmental projects, um, after school programs that you know, governments and cities tell us we can't afford anymore because right? we don't have money. Um, there's a long list of jobs and, and Rob and Matt and others have talked about all kinds of things. And this is the idea of the buffer stock. The current system, we have that red you know, box there of unemployment that we, we say we can't you know, afford to hire those people. With a job guarantee program, you immediately absorb everybody into useful, productive uh, community development uh, program. When there is a recession, you take all the unemployed. But when the private sector improves and the economy starts to boom, the private sector will start hiring workers away from the job guarantee program. So the size will shrink, and hence the, the, the buffer uh, uh, of, the, of the system. Now, can the private sector, how can the private sector convince somebody to quit their community development 
uh, job guarantee work and come work for them? Well, they have to compete. They have to offer them at least the same wage or some sort of perks, uh, benefits, retirement benefits, nice suit, you know, cell phones, whatever, whatever will attract a worker away from a local community uh, project. But uh, that's, uh, that's for us as a society to decide what is the minimum level of quality of life that a job should provide to a human being. And then anything above that is okay. But we're, we're setting the bar way too low for, for uh, us as a society. Uh, how to finance the job guarantee? I just talked about you know, functional finance budgeting. Uh, Randy yesterday talked about this, so I'm going to skip it in terms of you know, a private sector uh, surplus you know, balances with the government sector deficit. Minsky talks about 57 varieties of capitalism. There are 57 varieties of job guarantee programs, too. The problem with all of these varieties, most of these varieties, is that they're always designed as an emergency program. You know, when there is a massive crisis or a Great Depression, they're always limited in terms of who can qualify for the jobs, how long they can work, how many hours they can work. The wage is usually very limited in terms of uh, uh, how much um, employer, uh, employees uh, get in these programs. The US, we have the New Deal, in Sweden, a uh, very long tradition of employment programs. Argentina in the 2000s with a CAFES program, which was limited to uh, one head of household member um, for a certain number of hours. And then as soon as the economy sort of recovers and we're kind of going back to normal, usually all of these programs are canceled uh, through a political process uh, and removed. India has the largest job guarantee program now in the world, I think in terms of numbers. Um, it guarantees employment for 100 days to uh, rural um, uh, farm workers. Um, and again, it's limited to 100 days. The wage is uh, not very high. What we're proposing here is different. What we're proposing is a permanent buffer stock mechanism. We have a permanent buffer stock for corn. We don't say we'll just you know, have a buffer stock for corn when you know, occasionally. It's permanent. We have a buffer stock for oil. It's permanent for all of these commodities. And yet for people, we say we'll only have it temporarily at miserable wages um, and we'll cancel it as soon as we can. Um, proposals for the US, Pavlina presented some of her research. I've, I did some calculations a few years ago. You can have a three-tiered wage structure. You can offer a job guarantee program for skilled workers, semi-skilled workers, unskilled workers, starting at $15 an hour. You can, you can play around with the numbers. It doesn't matter. These are random numbers that I thought are reasonable. Um, but if, if I were to do it, uh, actually put it in place, it will be based on uh, state-based or city-based living wage or some sort of combination. But that, let's, let's see the numbers, even if you don't believe in functional finance and all this MMT stuff. Let's see if it's actually too expensive, because people say we can't afford it. It's too expensive. We're going broke. We have no money. So we d I did the calculation for 23 million people, which includes the unemployed, some of the you know, underemployed. It include all the categories, but a lot of people. Let's see if we employ them full time, you know, budget for uh, infrastructure, budget for all the raw materials that you need to buy. It's less than 4% of GDP. Now, how much did we spend after 2008 bailing out Wall Street and all the other companies? And it did not put a dent in unemployment. Um, and here we're talking about going directly to the problem, as Pavlina was saying early on, instead of you know, hoping that somehow the money that we're spending on Wall Street will trickle down to you know, central Ohio and will create full employment. The current recovery is obviously um, still problematic. Uh, you can phase in the program. You can say, well, it's too difficult to employ 23 million people at the same time. OK, fine, just do phase one, phase two, phase three. Start with the long-term unemployed. Find something. Do something. So what we're trying to do with, um, with a lot of these proposals and with our work with the Benzaga Institute is to say there are solutions. Um, you know, remember the Margaret Thatcher line that you know, there is no alternative, uh, the, the Tina idea. That really dominates public policy to this day. Uh, and what we're trying to say is there are plenty of alternatives, plenty of alternatives, and we're trying to showcase um, a lot of them in, uh, today and, uh, and um, uh, on our website. Uh, so the, the cost of the program is not expensive 
and in terms of ideas, there's no, the sky is the limit, as Rob said this morning. Once you understand the financing problem, the sky is the limit. Uh, developing countries, a lot of people say, well, well, they don't really have financial sovereignty. They can't really afford what the US or the UK can do. Um, there's quite a bit of literature on this. Uh, Jan Kriegel, um, back in the 90s, wrote this uh, paper essentially saying, is this only for rich countries or can developing countries also um, work on this? And his work on, um, uh, he was at UNCTAD at the UN for a long time and he really did um, um, fantastic work in terms of getting policy people and uh, economists to rethink this idea that you know, developing countries need more loans, right? That they need external financing. Um, uh, he really developed this idea that you know, what you need to do is mobilize domestic resources work at the local level. You don't need external financing. Um, because when you have financial sovereignty as a, as a country, you can build anything you want. The problem is developing countries have lost their financial sovereignty over time. And here's how we define financial sovereignty is when a country issues his, uh, its own currency, collects taxes in that same currency. A country must always borrow in its own currency, so issue government bonds denominated in your own currency, not in a foreign currency. Uh, and that's the problem with a lot of developing countries. They borrow in dollars or in euros, which they can't print, which means they have to export their way out of that debt. Um, and when you have a structural uh, trade problems, you're not going to be able to export your way out of that problem. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then the IMF and World Bank show up and say, we'll lend you more money to make it even more impossible for you to get out of this. So what we need to do is to regain financial sovereignty by moving away from uh, debt financed economic development uh, for emerging countries and developing countries to more domestic uh, uh, employment led um, economic development. This can't be done overnight, but we have to start somewhere. And, and for most of, most of countries, we're not even there. So we want a job guarantee led uh, development that um, focuses on mobilizing domestic resources and staying away from you know, uh, foreign financing as much as possible. Um, I'm gonna quickly mention a couple of other uh, studies that I uh, did and uh, Matt and Mike Kelsey uh, helped with the second one. Uh, in the case of Tunisia, same thing, developing country, lots of external debt problems, uh, and somebody mentioned, uh, Rob mentioned uh, Greece. The external debt problem is usually focused on two areas for most countries. Tunisia is a, a classic example. It's a, a food shortage and energy shortage. So no matter what you do in terms of borrowing, in terms of financing, in terms of interest rate, if you don't address the food shortage structural problem, you're always gonna import food. And if you don't address the energy deficit problem, you're always going to import energy. And we have all of these alternative energy solutions that only require domestic resources. You don't even have to import them. And we still say we need to borrow money so we can help Tunisia pay for its debt. Right? Um, so a job guarantee program for Tunisia will cost less than 5% of GDP and addresses all the unemployed, not a select few. Uh, a recent study we, we published at the Institute um, looks at Saudi Arabia, and I'll show some of the numbers here. Uh, we didn't want to include all the costs of unemployment. We just focused on the economic cost of the unemployment uh, in Saudi Arabia for 2 million people. We didn't count you know, the, the social issues and all the health issues, uh, just in terms of how much GDP is lost because of unemployment in Saudi Arabia. And it's close to 29% of GDP. Now, that's expensive in terms of, I don't know what the daily number would be in terms of Bill Mitchell's uh, approach. Um, whereas a very generous, very, very generous job guarantee program will only cost 5% of GDP. And yet we have people saying it's too expensive, we can't afford it, right? Uh, and these are some of the, the breakdown of the numbers. Uh, the report is on our website, uh, so uh, feel free to, to check it out. So for developing countries, um, the financial sovereignty aspect is, is important. So what, what I have here is a spectrum of financial sovereignty. You have countries who have full financial sovereignty, you have no external debt. The United States will be in that category. 
the U.S. national debt, all of it is denominated in U.S. dollars. So there is no solvency problem in terms of the U.S. debt. But then you have on the, on the other end of the spectrum countries who completely lost their financial sovereignty, who have no control over their, you know, or have no national currency, I should say, to begin with. So Greece would be in that situation. Uh, some countries completely dollarized and gave up their currency. Uh, but then you have a whole bunch in the middle who can have or can make the policy choices to move closer to the full financial uh, sovereignty end of the spectrum. I'm talking about a lot of emerging countries. Um, I'm talking about the case of Tunisia. I'm talking about the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, where if you design the right policy choices that address your actual domestic economic problems and leverage your domestic resources before you look outside the country, mostly labor resources, uh, and you focus those, especially in you know, a, a lot of Middle Eastern countries, it's water problems, it's food problems, uh, and I don't know if you've been to the Middle East, it's very sunny, <laughs> very, <laughs> very hot. Um, it's, it seems pretty obvious that you have a, a limitless source of energy, um, abundant source of young people who are unemployed, and youth unemployment is, is if people think about you know, terrorism being a problem, youth unemployment is, um, is going to change the world in bad ways if we don't address it very, very quickly. Um, and this is not just in the Middle East, this is across the world. I mean, Europe, what a waste. Generation, an entire generation of young people we spent a lot of money and energy and resources to educate them, get them to you know, a high school degree, to a college degree, and then we tell them, sorry, we don't have a job for you. What a waste, right? So if you, if you try to account for the financial cost of, um, of, of unemployment, youth unemployment, it's, it's unbelievable. And then I wanted to address very quickly a question that uh, Corey asked yesterday. So there are lots of ways of you know, financing these programs. When it comes to the local level, you don't necessarily have to wait for the federal government or the state government. In the US and around the world uh, in the last 10, 15 years, there's this um, really successful way of doing things at the local level with community organizations. So venture capitalists um, you know, find you know, interesting business ventures. They bet on those. Uh, they make money and sometimes lose money. But the way they work is they're not gonna give you money and say, good luck, see you in five years, please bring it back. They give you money plus consulting, plus you know, monitoring, plus the, all the logistics that you need to start a business that venture capitalists will provide. They work with you, right? And then they decided, well, we make a lot of money, we give it to charity, but what do we do? We give it to charity and then we tell them, good luck, see you later, see you next year, we'll give you more money next year. So over the last 15 years or so, um, some venture capitalists turned venture philanthropist. And what they did was, well, why don't we use the same model that we use in venture capitalism and apply it and work with nonprofit organizations, community development organizations. Instead of giving them money and saying, you know, give you know, food to the poor, good luck, see you next year, let's address the root cause of the problem. Let's try to maximize, not profits, but maximize social impact. Um, so this is, and, and there's a lot of SVP, um, uh, social venture partnership. We have two of them in Ohio, one in Cleveland, one in Cincinnati. Um, there's, I think the main ones is in San Francisco. SVP International is based in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. Seattle. Seattle? Okay. Um, this, is, this is one way to do it, you know, to get around the, the banking system, the financial system, uh, and it's a much more effective way um, of employing people. To conclude, the unemployment crisis coupled with the climate crisis call for urgent and bold actions and we're, we're not doing enough. The current jobs policies that we have are too weak, too expensive and ineffective. Uh, climate action policies are too slow, too small and maybe soon will be too late. Uh, we can't rely on market incentives and supply side economics to produce full employment. Full employment is possible, desirable, affordable, and is a prerequisite for sustainable prosperity. 
Thank you. Do five minutes of questions. We'll do answers over over lunch and answers throughout the day. over lunch. Yeah. I'm the moderator, so I'm just here. You moderate, okay? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, come up to the microphones. Even if your name is Rohan or Paul, come up to the microphone, so everybody online can hear your questions. Right. Um. Just want to thank everybody for the presentations. They were great. And uh, my question is for uh, Fidel. Thank you for the talk. Um, but uh, what I want to know is, um, does the uh, or could the job guarantee program be used to expand public mass public or mass public transportation systems like clean light rail? And if so, how do we convince policymakers that this does not compete with uh, private sector industries that are dependent on fossil fuel um, like uh, the auto airline industry? Let's collect all the questions and try to um, well, uh, Thank you. And the, the job guarantee programs are about funding things that need to be funded. One of the things that I think is gaining some awareness in the general public is about we are paying Walmart's profits through subsidizing their workers. Um, so would this have anything about taking away subsidies for crappy payers? Right. Short answer is yes. But let's go ahead. Oh, okay. We have a new chair of like crappy payers. <laughs> Okay, and thank you, that's better. And then uh, the other one was an actual question. If we do actually do encourage these uh, other nation states to move towards their own sovereign control of their currencies, how are you gonna address the problem of the petrodollar? Uh, we've had people killed for encouraging, or, uh, suggesting we move away from the dollar as a trade standard <laughs> for oil. So like Gaddafi and Thank you so much for your talk. It makes way too much sense. It'll never work. Um, <laughs> this is really exciting stuff, and it's obviously it's a macro issue that must be implemented. We're wondering if, two, one, what are the responses of people in power when you have suggested this? Two, is there a possibility of immediately impacting programs like this on a micro level in small communities? Obviously, self-interest there. And then three, how are you addressing the sociological, the psychological, the economic, and even the well, the, uh, the overall impact of what's happening to people in poverty and how we enter them into jobs uh, on this level and how it's successful. And then my final question, uh, I'm just so grateful for you guys and what you're doing. This is a real ray of light for people in small communities like us that are doing community development. Thank you very much. For that panel, yeah, I think we're we're standing between you and uh, and lunch. I just um, want to make one comment. Yep. It, uh, oh, okay, and then we'll sorry, take more fine. questions okay. in the afternoon yeah, sure. panel. We're gonna have yeah, a panel yeah. in the afternoon that's just Q and A, just so that we can take some. Yeah, questions. a lot of this will be answered in the very last panel before, before dinner. Uh, so let's let's take the questions and, and then move to lunch. Okay, do the opposite of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear somebody address the how to say the implementation of this the uh, MMT standard covertly. And what I mean is uh, basically Bretton Woods is to when that was um, 
done under the presumption that the U.S. had the largest reserve of gold at that time. But in fact, it basically set up a capture uh, uh, by the uh, Wall Street, London, City of London, et cetera, relative to funding and getting the various developing countries into debt. So there's, there's a, a working of the angles in there as well. Oh. Thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Lunch is upstairs, so let's uh, let's get lunch and uh, and uh, we have a keynote speaker also for lunch, so we don't. Want to. Yeah, so we'll answer these questions. I, I we'll answer these questions in the afternoon panel. Um, thank you.